thank you for all that you do. I need you to speak, Lord, because it will not be worth hearing if you don't. So I pray, Father, that you convey your message to your people. Not only would you be my mouthpiece, but be their ear, your earpiece. That what they hear is you, because that's who they need. That's who encourages and strengthens us, who draws us to himself, who equips us, who heals us. Everything that we hope for in this life, he's the object of it. So I just pray, Father, that you would do these things for us here today. I pray that we leave here a little more encouraged than when we came in. In Christ's name, amen. I, as I've been praying, I finally settled in a book. Um, and I, I love Malachi. It's, um, it's, sometimes it's referred to as the, the book of silence because there's about a 400-year period from this prophet to John the Baptist um, when he begins to walk and do his ministry. Uh, there's a lot that goes on in the 400 years that you'll probably hear in Josh's history class, I, I'm guessing. Uh, people like the Maccabees, and it's where we get Hanukkah and things like that. So there's a lot going on. But in terms of God speaking to his people, it's the last prophet into the New Testament. And, and I, as I began to meditate on where we were as a country and all those kind of things, and then really just trying to move on from all of that, I began to think about what it is or how we get to the place we are, how we get in this situation, how we get in our struggles, and how we can stay out of them. <laughs> um, and, and, and so in Malachi, and, and I, you know, just to cover some, there's so much here. We've got a lot to do in this first five verses. Um, we often read this passage in light of, uh, certainly if you're a Reformed thinking or a sovereign God, God thinking, you'd certainly love to look at Jacob I loved and Esau I hated in a particular context. And I'm not going to deny that. I support that. But there's so much more here. So much more. And the question that burdened my heart, and that's the one I want to answer here this morning, is in um, verse 2. I have loved you, says the Lord, yet you say, in what ways have you loved us? Has, has anybody ever questioned whether God loved them? I think you probably have, if you're honest. You, had, you didn't say that, do you love me, God? But your actions may have said it. The other questions you asked may have said it. The doubt you had about what was going on in your life may have said it. You may have looked at the rest of the world and could understand why they can do what they do and you can't. You questioned it. These folks had questioned it. And for a little context, uh, if you were with us during our Nehemiah study, and, and we've referred to it plenty of times, um, there's an answer. And I'm not going to go into great detail on it, but just to set this pattern or the stage here and, and give us some context. At the end of Nehemiah chapter 13, if you remember the story, uh, Nehemiah had come, he had gotten permission from Artaxerxes to come and, and rebuild the wall. And he does it in record time, 52 days. And you remember there was a couple of guys, Tobiah and Sanballat, who gave him a little hassle along the way in the wall building. Remember those guys? They questioned everything he did. They wrote open letters, which was nothing more. An open letter is letting everybody know your gossip and running your mouth, and that's what they did. That's what people do today. They open, open, open letters are the equivalent of running your mouth about somebody. That's the equivalent. And so that's what they did, and they were attacking him. Of course, you know, Nehemiah, he, 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 he was a brilliant, strong, in the Lord man, and he built that wall, and he set a reestablished worship, and he reestablished a number of things in that community in Jerusalem. And then he goes, and he goes back to Artaxerxes, because remember, he told the king, I'm going to go for so many days, and I'm going to come back. Because the king said, how long are you going to be gone? What are you going to do? How long are you going to be gone? How much does it cost? And there's a concept a governor ought to think about. <laughs> And so he told him, I'm going to go here. I mean, it's going to be this long. I need this much money. That's what he got. He came back. So he goes back, and he serves the king for a season, 12 years. And then he comes back on that 13th year. And when he comes back on the 13th year, he comes back to Jerusalem, and he finds out a few things that Israel had started to do. They had started, they had went back, and, and, and the, the first thing they did, they had mixed themselves with people of the world. If you go back and read Nehemiah 13, they had mixed themselves with the people of the world. And I don't mean they were in the same room or on the same street or in the same country. That's not what I'm talking about. Because Paul deals with that idea. You have to be in the world. You don't, the difference is of the world. You and I have to be in the world. If you think you, you're going to be out of the world, you're out of the world. 
Okay? Now, you can go live on a rock on, in a mountaintop. You can do a lot of things, but you're still in the world. You can be in the world in Chiefland and not be of the world. And this is what they had done. They had mixed themselves back. They had taken on everything, that the, the very people they were supposed to be separated from, they had taken that back on. So that was the first thing he did. And so when they read from the law of Moses in chapter 13, verse 3, they realized that, and they understand that, and they start to separate. But then when Nehemiah finds something else out, he finds Elisha, the high priest at that time, had moved in a guy, of all people, the grandson of Tobiah, into the temple. Had moved out the location for the Levites and moved him in. He was so intermixed with the people of that world that his grandfather-in-law was Tobiah. Think about that. The very guy who was the, uh, the epitome of, of anger and wrath and separation and, 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 the, and the, against God, he is now in-laws with. And he moves the guy in. Ne Nehemiah gets there and sees all that and then like, punt, for lack of a better way, pushes him out and tries to clean up the, the, the location. But another thing that had happened was that the offering had become defiled because that was the location of the storage of the offering that the people of God were commanded to bring to the temple. And since the offering was defiled and it was no longer being brought in, the priests, guess what they had to do? They had to leave the temple service and they had to go to the fields and work. And this is not a sermon on paying your preacher. This is a sermon on being separated from the things of the world and how it hinders your worship which separates you from God. And that's the reason we are where we are. And so that's what was going on. And then at the end of it, guess what they had done? Not only had they just mixed with the people, but as I said earlier, like Elijah had done, they had married. To the point where if you read it, Nehemiah, he has enough of it that he grabs the guy by the throat and starts yanking his hair out. You heard about St. Nicholas in the history class, maybe punching a guy. Nehemiah grabs him by the yank. What are you doing? What are you doing? God has delivered us. He has brought us back. He has set up the wall. He has put the temple back in place. And this is what you're doing. And they separate themselves from the, their wives that they had taken. Ezra was so severe that they took, separated themselves from their wives and the children they had produced. Because let me go ahead and tell you, when you marry sin, you're going to have evil offspring. You can count on it. And count on. So that's what's going on. And I want to give you some another little context. From the end of Nehemiah chapter 13 to the beginning of Malachi is 92 years. For some context, and praise be to God for the testimony of this man's life, but that's how long Brother Kelton lived. In his lifetime, in, in, in an equivalent lifetime, it goes from we have been restored we have the wall, we have the temple, to Malachi. And in Malachi, they're asking the question, I have loved you, says the Lord, yet you say, in what way have we loved you? See, when, you, when, you do those, when those things begin to be a part of our lives, when we mix with the enemy, and I don't like, again, not, I mean mix with the enemy. I mean, hey, enemy, we're buddies. Hey, enemy, I do what you do. Hey, enemy, and I mean the enemy of God, not the enemy of man. I'm talking about those who, set, who are against the things of God because you can either, if you're friends with the world, then you're in enmity with God. That's how it works. You can't be friends with the world. See, and we've misunderstood being in the world with being friends in the world. You can be obedient to the government. You can honor the king. The scripture clearly tells us to honor the king, even if it's Biden. I know some of you are choking right now. I'm trying to help you. I'm prepared to help you. Nowhere in there does it say, unless they're Democrat, then you don't have to. You know why? It's going to be better for you if you honor the king. Your life's, it's going to be better. I pray we have a leader that would honor God and the Constitution. Don't misunderstand me. If you think contrary to that, you don't know me. But nonetheless, Scripture has precedent. 
when we mix with the enemy, what we can't do any longer is worship the way God would have us. When we move the enemy in and pollute the offering, we can't worship anymore. When we neglect the house of God, and I don't mean the building. You know, I, we've talked about this countless times, but I have to say it again. I don't mean this building, although I did call you to come down here and do some stuff next week because of the neglect. But the real neglect is, in this day, it was the temple of God, the house of worship, and, and now the neglect today is you. Do you not know you were the temple of God, and so you are the house of worship? That we, When we neglect that. When we adopt the world practices, we break the word of God. See, they had and they had married those women from that day and they weren't supposed to. This is what happens. It separates us from God. It makes our worship hollow because I want you to understand something. In Malachi's day, they were still going to worship. They were still going to the temple and offering. They were still doing those things because the entire book is dealing with every one of those elements that I just listed for you that they continued to practice but were as foreign from God as lost men are today. They were going in there and they, they thought they were worshiping. They were still going and making an offering. They were still going there and, and the high priest was still going in. But you do know that there was no Ark of the Covenant. There was no mercy seat. There was nothing in the Holy of Holies for God to dwell on had it, the blood been offered in the right manner. It just wasn't. And so it began to be progressively and continually more hollow, more empty, more worthless, vain, Worship. It meant nothing. And when your hot, when your worship is hot, empty and hollow and vain and worthless, you know what starts to happen to you. You start to wonder whether God loves you. You start to question God's love for you. You start to debate in your mind whether the God that you say you believe in has it cares for me, whether or not I He really loves me. How could He love me and this happen in my life? How how could this love us and our country be this way? How can He love me and this go on? He answers the question for them in these verses. But He answers them in reverse. Or contrary to saying, here's all the reasons why I love you. He says, first of all, yet you say in what way have we loved... In what way, and you say, in what way have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, says the Lord, yet Jacob have I loved, but Esau I have hated. Now, let me go ahead and tell you right now, you, and I'm totally on the whole idea of the sovereignty of God, and there is, you know, guess what? God can hate people. You know, He's God. He can qualify to do that. He's the only one holy and righteous and true to actually hate somebody in a true, holy, righteous manner. None of us have any ability to rightly hate anybody because we do not have what He has, holy, righteous perfection that allows me to hate in a true way. Matter of fact, I'm told to love my enemies, to do good to those who hate me and despitefully use me. God is truly and holy and loves. And yet here He says, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. He does. Now we can, I understand hating the things that God hates. That's why I hate divorce. God says He hates it. I understand. But in this context, I want to tell you about Jacob and Esau. Let me tell you about Esau first. Esau was our kind of man. He was our kind of man. Esau is, is a man who hunted. And I don't mean just occasionally get in the woods, you know, might come home with a dead squirrel. I'm talking about a man who knew how to hunt, how to track animals, who now knew how to pursue them. He was the kind of man that other men looked up to. He was the kind of man that men, when they said, man, that's a man's man, they talked about Esau. When they said, here, this is a, this is a, yeah. You want your children to grow up, be like Esau. He was strong. He was powerful. He worked. He was the firstborn. He had authority. 
He was so many things. As a matter of fact, here's how I would describe Esau. Today's terms. Esau wore a ball cap and drives a pickup truck. Works six days a week. Hunts on Saturday. Goes to church on Sunday and visits mom in the afternoon. If it was a Friday night, we would find him in, on his tailgate in the back of the in the parking lot at Walmart. Esau is our kind of guy. Now Jacob, on the other hand, Jacob is the kind of guy that when I was a kid, we would have said, you just are a mama's boy. Jacob likes to cook. He likes to sit in the house. He likes to hang out with his mama. He's tied to his mama's apron strings. His mama loves him. His daddy don't really like him all that much. Bible says Esau, you know, he loved Esau. Isaac loved Esau, but, you know, he's that kind of guy. We would never call him to go hunting. We wouldn't call he, he's, he may He may or may not know, even know how to pick up a saw. God hates Esau, the firstborn. But he loves Jacob, the secondborn. And I want you to know something today, that God always hates the firstborn. He's always been angry with the firstborn. He's always been dealing with you in your firstborn life. He's always been angry with your sin. He's always been angry. He's, he, you know, I, I heard somebody say it this way one time. Uh, I, I've noticed that God, you know, you'll try, to, you'll try to reason out that God hates sin, but He loves a sinner, and I understand that, but I kind of wish God would punish the sin instead of me. I noticed my mama, when I was a boy, she never punished the thing I did. She always punished me. She always took it out on me. Why don't you whip them, mama? You know, they're the sinners, not me, you know. God has always been angry with the firstborn. And he's always been in love with the secondborn. That's why he says so plainly in John chapter 3, you must be born again. Why? Because he's always angry with the firstborn. Remember, see, the firstborn is the one that fell in Adam. The firstborn is the one that has the nature of sin, has the heart of sin, desires sin. He's, and God always hates that. Don't ever lose sight of that. God always hates that. He always will. He's going to punish it forever. But he's always been in love with the secondborn. Those who by faith are begotten again into a living hope. Those by faith have been renewed. That is who he loves. So he's telling the Jews here in this day, yeah, you see guys, I have always loved you. Those of you who by faith believe me. And I've always been angry with Esau. And I want you to know today, the reason that we struggle and where we are is because we lose sight of that. And when we lose sight of that and we start to walk in the first man, we, instead of walking by faith, we walk by sight. Instead of walking in the Spirit, we walk in the flesh. And every time we walk in the flesh, and every time we walk by sight, and every time we do that, what we're doing is walking in the old man Esau, the one God hates. He always will. And every time we go that route, what we do is we separate ourselves from God because God's not, you're not going to come and worship Him in a way that honors Him unless there's repentance. It's just not going to happen. Now we can go into all the great details. I can tell you the good news is, is that it, because of God's eternal decrees about your life, He's going to bring you back. Now it might be hard on you. It might be some long suffering. But like every good father, he's going to make sure his children are going to be brought in. David and I were having this conversation last night, and his, his, he said, I can't imagine anything my children could possibly do that would cause me not to love them. I said, I agree, brother. And we also agreed there were a lot of things they could do that they could certainly earn our anger and wrath over. <laughs> 
He's always there. And when we walk that way, we begin to walk in the man that God hates. And our worship becomes hollow, becomes empty, becomes separated from God. And in 92 years, they had went from, and just in 12 years, they'd already added all those things to the temple worship. And in another 92 years, they have completely, like, once again, separated themselves from that and to the point where they're going, well, God must not love us. And you see in the passage, he, when he said, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. And he laid waste his mountains and his heritage for the jackals of the wilderness. I want you to know that as long as you try to build in the flesh... Build in Esau. Build in the first man. You can expect God to tear it down. God's not going to say, well, that's okay, Robin. In my, in my lifetime, in my Christian walk, the one thing that has been a, a very common denominator is that any time Robin got off on Robin's ideas about how we are to build something, God invariably takes it down. He's not going to let me build anything in Esau. Certainly not worship. One of the great debates that happen in churches, and I only pick on Southern Baptist churches because I don't know any others. I've only had the privilege of basically attending Southern Baptist churches. But one of the common things that happens in Southern Baptist churches before it's over with, somebody has divided over how worship's supposed to be. And I want you to know that this worship ain't how you think it ought to be, and it's only how God thinks it ought to be because it's only for Him that the worship is being done. Right, And when we try to build it in Esau as an example, we can expect God to tear it down. But if we build in Jacob, then our worship becomes true. Our worship becomes real. Our worship becomes meaningful. This is why He can tell us to pray without ceasing. This is why we can go away joyful. This is why we can sing His praises at all times. We don't need the piano, although praise God for the people who play. When our worship is in the, from the second man or through the second man. See, Adam was one man, but Jesus is the life-giving spirit. He's the second man. He's the man that God loves. See, I want you to know something else. The love God for after us comes through Jesus Christ. That's how He loves us. All things are of Him, through Him, and to Him. All things. So is God's love for you in all things or not? Therefore, all things are of Him, through Him, and to Him. And so even His love is through the Son. Because remember when we stand before God, well, who are we supposed to smell like, me and you? That would be, remember the story? This smells like my son Esau. And Jacob got received because he smelt like Esau. Well, I got some kind words for you. When you smell like Jesus, you can get received. But you go to smelling like the firstborn? And I got news for you, my old life was pretty nasty, pretty stanky, pretty bad. And Lord, don't let that odor come up. I need to smell like Jesus. But if you build in, in, in Esau, you can expect God to tear it down. If your worship is built in, in Esau, you can expect God to tear it down. If your prayer life is built in Esau, you can expect God to tear it down. If, you're, if your meditation is built on Esau, you can expect God to remove it. But if it's built in Jacob, you can see God to increase it. You can see your worship f- fulfill what worship is required to fulfill, which is the ongoing, continual, deep, intimate relationship with the living God. The real reason you say, does God love me, is because my lack of relationship with God. God is love. So how do I, can I say, well, does God love me? When God is love, and if I'm worshiping God and I'm intimate with God, by definition, I should know God's love. I should know His intimate love for me. That shouldn't be a question. So if I'm having that question, then the problem is not. And I've went back to Esau. If my prayer life is the prayer life of Jacob, the second man, the Lord Jesus Christ. Then my prayer are heard. Isn't that what he said in John 17? I know that you hear me. God who loves me, I know that he hears me. Biggest struggle probably we all have next to does God love me is does God hear in me? Because I still got this problem. 
I'm still sick. I still have this struggle. I still have this hurt. I still have this whatever it is. And then we must not be hearing me. Well, when I'm walking in Esau, I can count on God not listening. Now, be honest. Are there ever times you had your children and you were taken care of, but you wasn't listening to nothing they said? Am I the only one who ever did that? Y'all talk all you want. I'm not listening. It's the only way I'm going to get to New York is if I don't listen to y'all in the back seat. Not that you quit fighting with each other and tearing at each other and being mad at each other and acting like your daddy and start acting like your mama back there. <laughs> Help me, Lord. When I walk in the old man, I can expect God not to listen. But when I walk in the new man, I can expect God to hear. And God is simply telling him, look at, look at Esau and how I treated Esau. I laid his mountains and his heritage waste. And another thing about that mountain and heritage, and I want you to think about something. Where, where does our help come from? It comes from the Lord. Where do we look? We look to the mountain. What is our heritage? Our heritage is Jesus Christ. See, our heritage and our mountain is secure when we walk in the born-again man, in the new man. In the old man, it's being torn down, but in the new man, it's being built up. That's what we have. That's what our hope is. He says, for the jackals of the wilderness. You can do a lot of studies on the jackals. It could be hyenas. It could be any creature. The fact is, I'm going to call it the roaring lion seeking whom he can devour. You want to know devil's purpose? Well, it's to eat up the wicked. To distort, to do the very thing God is going to do, and he'll use him the same as anything else. But he says, I'm going to tear it down. He says, look at what they say, though. Even though Edom has said, we have been impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places, says the Lord of hosts. Isn't that what we do? When we're walking into old man, well, that didn't work. I'll do something else. Let's go a different way. We couldn't impeach him, so we'll do this. Sorry, I couldn't help it. We'll, we'll, we'll do this. I'm going to build it again. Because I'm never going to consider that maybe, maybe I'm walking in the flesh and I'm not walking in the Spirit. And the real reason this is being taken down is because God doesn't approve. I'm just going to go do something else. The Edoms never, ever thought that. And the more they tried to build it up in the flesh, the more God said, Go back to the plains of Sinar in Genesis and read how they said, Hey, we're going to build a tower to God. And God said, No, no you're not. That's why the Mazigarot things are sitting all over the country world now because that's the only thing remaining from the flood, I personally think, is after it all you can see those things. So those people were building all that junk because they were trying to build a temple to God. God said, no, I'm going to give all of you a different language and you're all going to build little worship centers all over the known world. But if we'll walk in the new man, then the things we lay our hands to will be of value. Because I'll tell you, the, new, the things that are value, not the things we're going to go and build and do. I'm building a little barn over at my house. It's great. It's awesome. It's going to burn up with his coming. Doesn't change the fact I should do all my best effort to make it the best I can because everything we do, we do as unto the Lord. But even though that's true, it's still going to burn down when he returns. So I really need to be doing some work that, and building up some things that are actually going to be here when the kingdom's here. You know what that is? That's His people. The only thing that's going to survive the fire are His people. Nothing else will survive. Nothing survives the wrath of God, which is a consuming fire that's going to come across the whole land. And if I'm really going to build something in that new man, then what I'm going to build is with silver, gold, and precious stones, I'm going to work in the lives of people to encourage them in the gospel, to equip them to walk in faith, to be the church of God, to encourage and train and teach so that the most important thing that goes on in their life is the kingdom, is Christ, is His church, 
is His people. And to understand that the rest of this stuff is all going to disappear with His coming. We, I hope all of you are healthy, wealthy, prosperous, and everything. But the fact is you may not be, and it doesn't matter if you are in Christ. And you will build the things that are Christ, and those things will remain. And on that day, on that day, that's what will be there. You've got loved ones. You've got mamas, daddies, brothers, sisters, children. Start building the kingdom in them. Start pouring in them the truth of God's Word. Teach them not to walk in Esau. Lay down the old man and walk in the new man. The man by faith. And we'll spend a... If we spend as much time teaching our children to walk in the new way as we do teaching them how to go to school and get a job and to work and to make money, if we spend it's equal, just equal amount of time. Just equal. And I'm not saying one of those things are bad. There's not one thing bad there. But if we spend an equal amount of time, how would our children's and our parents' and our siblings' lives be different? How would your own life be different? Because remember the struggle here is, do you love me, God? And and our worship has become hollow and separated because we walk in Esau and we don't walk in Jacob. The Bible says if you walk in the Spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's what we're called to do. A little bit more here, and then I'll be to my point. (laughs) They may build up, but I will throw down. Do you really want to be building against God? I mean, you know, He only spoke a word and flooded the whole place to 30 cubits. It wasn't like that was effort for God. Flood. (laughs) Do you want to be building against God? Then build in Jacob. They will, he says, they may build, but I will throw down. They shall be called the territory of wickedness. The territory of wickedness? Notice, the Esau man, the first man, his territory can be the territory of wickedness. That's why we can be in the world, but not of the world, because we can be there. But when we walk in Jacob, when we walk in the new man, when we walk in Jesus Christ our Lord, then even in the midst of that territory, we are that new man. We are walking in a way that will honor and please God. And guess what? God says, I love you. Because by contrast, for every mountain that he tears down of Esau, he builds up for Jacob. For every thing that Esau builds and God takes away, and Jacob, God increases it. For every territory of wickedness, look what God says. And the people against whom the Lord will have indignation forever, your eyes shall see and you, you shall say, the Lord is magnified beyond the border of Israel. God is magnified in the punishment of Esau. God is magnified when He punishes the wicked. He's going to be magnified on the day when He punishes all the wicked. And if you're walking in Esau, you will get your magnification on that day as well. Because He's going to punish the wicked. God is just as magnified in delivering you and I from from sin, from enslavement, from the devil, as He is in punishing the wicked. The Bible tells us that even the wicked are His for the day of judgment. Even the wicked are His for the day of judgment. So so my question, and this is what I... My last note. My last note. How's your worship? See, because I want you to see something. When your worship... When you worship the God of the heaven and earth, the God of the Bible, the God of the New Testament, when you worship the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, when you fall into worship, which is praise, honor, and glory to the one true God, that's what it is. 
Not you, not how you like it, not how you want it, not any of that, not how Robin thinks it ought to be. It doesn't matter. It's his. It's all for him. When that worship is that way, then I have come into the presence of the living God because of what his son has done on the cross and in the Holy of Holies offering his own blood so that I might boldly come into the throne room of grace and have my prayers heard and my struggles covered and my needs met at the throne room of grace, I can come into His presence. And I can't come in there if I'm walking in Esau. Esau never could. And despite what Jacob was, the Bible calls him the deceiver. Despite what Jacob was because of the tender mercies of our God and the blood of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, Jacob could. And you can too in Jesus Christ. And that's the good news here today. I want you to know God loves you, children of God. And How do I know? Because your mountains and your heritage are not destroyed. He has not torn down the things we build in God. You're not the territory of wickedness. And you see the glory of God. That's who we worship. Seek the Lord about your worship. Seek the Lord about your prayer time. Seek the Lord about your meditation in Him. See what you've been focusing on. See if your worship hasn't actually been focused on you in sort of a roundabout way. See if your prayer time hasn't really hasn't been all about you and not about the Lord. See if your meditation has been on the world and not the Spirit of God. Because you know what? I had to check myself and I found out some of that was true in my life. I can make my prayer life all about me real quick. I can make my meditation go strictly from, the, oh, I'm studying the Word of God, to, man, I'm worried about what Biden's doing. He's, he can't do nothing, so I don't know why I'm worried about it. <laughs> Sorry, that's two today. <laughs> Forgive me, Lord. I go real quick. And when I do that, I'm no longer walking in the new man. I've went back to the old man. And I've noticed about the old man, I have to renew my efforts to put him down every single day. For a guy I whipped yesterday, he is fresh again today. It's not like when we were kids we got in fights with the bullies and five minutes later we was best buddies for the rest of the school year. Right? That ain't how it works in my flesh. He wakes up next morning and says, I'm going to get you again, Robin. Remember that one thought? We're going to start with that. Remember that one prayer you didn't? We're going to start there. Remember when you meditated on it? We're going to go right there, Robin. Let's start with that. Sometimes he wakes me up early just to do these things. And I have to beat him down right then. Ask God to show me. Ask God to remind me. and Ask God to help me. And I have to worship God. Sometimes it's just about you're great God and I'm not. And I'm just going to stop right there with everything i got to say. I worship you. I thank you that you've opened that door. I thank you that because of your son, I can be born again and I can be Jacob, not Esau. God's been angry with Esau. He hates Esau. He hates you if you want to continue in the old man. Can I be bold? He's going to hate you if you continue in the old man. But if you'll surrender, if you'll repent, if you'll believe and start to walk in the new man, God loves you. He really does. I know He does. Because His Word has repeatedly confirmed it for me. His presence has assured me. He loves us. Father, in the name of Jesus, we've come here today. I pray, Father, for anybody who's here who, who's still walking in the old man, trying to do things their will, their way, their wants, their, all of that, and it's, and it's just not working. Father, I pray for a supernatural touch that you would... Bear them up and, and labor again to see Christ born in them, as Paul said, that you would cause them to be birthed even here this moment into a living hope, into the life of Jesus, into the second born. I pray, Father, that you would do that. And I pray for my church family, Father, who, just like me, have their good days in you and their struggles, and they didn't, who walk as best they can in the Spirit, but the flesh catches us. I pray for you to strengthen them in that inner man, 
so that they could be renewed day by day to take hold of that old man and put him down and walk in that new way, to be assured of walking in that new way, to have strength to walk in you. Father, it's, it's, you know, Lord, I'm not telling you nothing you don't know, but we are acknowledging it's crazy out there. It's crazy everywhere. And we need to not walk in that, in that crazy, Lord, so help me to walk in a new way. I don't have any other words to say, Lord, but you've said it all already. I thank you that you love Jacob, despite what he was. And you made him what you wanted him to be. And I rejoice in that truth here today. I love you and I thank you and I pray, Father, that we worship in spirit and truth every day. In Jesus' name, amen.